This might look like a normal PlayStation controller, but it's much more than that. It's a turbo controller. Wow. But not one you can just go out and buy. This is a never before seen custom mod called the Dr. Masho. Designed by Dash Retro, it includes a custom PCB set and off the shelf components to modify your original PlayStation controller with enhanced and adjustable turbo functionality. Sony never released a first party turbo controller, so this design gives the comfortable feel of that original remote while providing some additional improvements over third party options. Today we'll be taking an in depth look at this controller mod, discussing with the creator why there was a need for it, explaining the design theory, how it works, assembling it from start to finish, and of course, showing it off. And by the end of it all, you might just want your own. So let's get into it. Hey everyone, I'm here today with my good friend Jake. You might know him as Dash Retro if you follow the Final Fantasy VII speedrunning community. Jake is the one who designed this mod that we'll be talking about today. Sorry, the Dr. Masho. For some quick context, speedrunning FF7 is what inspired this mod in the first place. And so we'll be talking about that quite a bit as we go forward. I've got to do a shameless plug for you here and just point out that you are currently number nine world record for Final Fantasy speedrunning. I think it's 10 now. That's the most popular category, right? Not uh, turbo, but the one you're number nine in. Yeah, any percent no slots. And so turbo, that's the same thing, right? But you can just use a turbo controller. Correct. And most people, they would have to use a third party controller because Sony never made a turbo controller. That's right, yeah. And so that's kind of what like the whole point of this mod is, is the fact that I'm not a big fan of third party controllers. The D-pad and the buttons just don't really feel right. What this mod does is it adds turbo to a Sony controller. And then the second nice thing about it is it is a dedicated turbo button. It's not like you have to turn it on and turn it off different buttons and stuff it's just this is your turbo button and then lastly like the other kind of benefit that this has over a regular turbo controller is that the turbo rate is actually controlled by the console's polling rate itself and so the mod is comprised of you have three custom boards here that actually go into the controller i just have a regular ps1 controller here and i have yours jake yeah they look the same pretty much right except pretty for much. these keycaps that's right so we take the daughter board out that has the analog sticks on it and replace it with the Dr. Masho board, which has these... So, uh, so it fits in there kind of something like this, yes. I imagine. Okay. Yeah. Those are 3D printed keycaps on it to uh, have buttons. Let's get into a little bit more about the design and put it together so we can start trying it out. But first, I want to thank PCBWay for sponsoring this video. PCBWay offers a fast and affordable path to make your hobby circuit projects a reality. After creating the circuit design in KiCad or your preferred software, it only takes a few minutes to go through the coding tool and upload the files. After doing this, we had quality boards in hand in less than a week. PCBWay also offers flex circuits, 3D printing, and much more, and I'd highly recommend them for your next electronics project. Before we dive into the details, I want to quickly summarize what this mod will do as a whole. It provides turbo functionality on a first party controller. Turbo can be turned on momentarily and released or latched so you can walk away from the controller while it still delivers button presses. It allows switching between what button will have turbo applied, and turbo will be frame perfect, meaning the controller only delivers button presses at a rate that the console is checking for them. Now let's go over how Jake achieved all of this in his design. To understand how the mod works, it's necessary to first understand the basics of how the digital inputs on a controller work. So the controller cable has a few signals that are coming in from the console. Red and black are power and ground, and the yellow cable is called the tension, or ATT. And that line is going to be very useful to us in a second. Now these lines connect to the main chip on the controller. This chip also has a dedicated pin for each button, so the D-pad, square, circle, X, triangle, start and select, and the four shoulder buttons. In total, that's 14 pins on the chip dedicated to knowing when a button is pressed or not pressed. Each of these pins are normally pulled high, meaning there is a small positive voltage on them, and that is the state where the button is released or not being pressed. When you press a button, it completes a circuit to ground and the pin is pulled low, meaning there is now effectively zero voltage on that pin. So the chip knows what buttons are being pressed by which of its powered data pins are pulled low. And through analog to digital conversion, it reads these states as either a 1 or a 0, which to us means you're either not pressing the button or you are. So these ones and zeros are just bits of data that aren't doing anything until they are called for by the console. In this simplified graphic of the controller chip, each physical button pin is represented on the bottom. And up top, we have power, ground, and attention, or ATT. A button signal will not be registered until the console pulls the ATT line low. This is called polling, and it happens at a rate of 60 times per second, at least for PS1 and PS2. 
During a polling cycle, ATT is pulled low, and essentially a photograph is taken of the bit state, one or zero, of each button pin. Then the console processes that data stream to know what buttons are pressed or not pressed. Towards the end of the polling cycle, ATT is pulled high, which erases the earlier photograph so that it's ready to capture button inputs again in the next cycle. To reiterate, the console pulls the controller one time per 60 FPS frame. Every frame it does this, and so the key of Jake's implementation of perfect turbo is utilizing the natural polling rate of the console. Third party solutions generally use a separate timing circuit which doesn't align perfectly with the console polling rate, and this leads to some inputs being dropped or otherwise not recognized. In a practical sense, those few dropped inputs likely wouldn't be noticeable during gameplay, but it's just cool and kind of brilliant that Jake decided to use the 60Hz timer that's already available in the controller. So at this point you might be wondering, okay, you have the ATT timer, but how do we use it to press buttons for us? To answer that question, as well as explain how the mod works as a whole, we need to take a look at Jake's schematic, which for now I'll simplify to make the explanation a bit more straightforward. On the lower left is our controller chip again, we have power, ground, and the ATT line that we just discussed, and our button pins are on the bottom. This large component tied to the power source is the primary mod chip for achieving turbo. It's an IC component called a flip-flop. It's aptly named because that's exactly what it does. It flip-flops the output when the input signal changes from low to high. The ATT line is tied to the clock of the flip-flop, and the output is on pin Q. We'll talk more about the flip-flop signal manipulation in just a second. The Q output terminates to the base of this transistor, which is being used as a switch. When Q is low, the transistor acts as an open, and so nothing happens. But when Q changes to high, the transistor turns on, so to speak, allowing current flow which grounds the button pin, aka pulls it low. And remember that to the console's interpretation, this means that the button is pressed. Now also, that's only happening if our turbo button is pressed. When the turbo button is not pressed, it creates another open and so the console receives no button inputs regardless of what the ATT line and the flip-flop are doing. As you'd expect, and of course, this is the purpose of having a physical button to turn turbo on and off. The question remains, how are we using the ATT line to deliver button presses? It's time to answer that by taking a closer look at the flip-flop. We're feeding it the ATT polling signal as input, so here's that waveform again from earlier. The output cue changes states whenever the input changes from low to high. Following that rule, we can generate this output waveform for pin Q. Remember that the console is checking for the bit state of the buttons every time that ATT is pulled low. Here we can see that the flip-flop is giving us an alternating output, 1, 0, 1, 0, etc., each time that happens. So what the console reads is that on frame 1, the button is released, and on frame 2, it is pressed, frame 3 released, frame 4 pressed, and so on and so on. We need to have that in-between frame where the button is not pressed, otherwise just holding down a button on any controller would be turbo. Now the console doesn't care about this, but the games themselves are coded to check whether you released a button before it will register another input for that button. This leads to a complication, which is that some games only look for inputs every other frame, at a rate of 30Hz instead of 60 For those games, the output Q will not work for us, because every other time ATT is pulled low, the state of Q remains constant, low in this case. And so to the game, this is effectively the same thing as just holding a button down and never releasing it. To rectify that, we can feed the Q signal back into the flip-flop on a separate clock pin and get another output which we'll call Q2. The same rule applies and we can generate the Q2 waveform by drawing a state change each time the Q pin changes from low to high. We'll call that first pin Q1 from now on. Now we can see that for a 30Hz input check, Q2 changes state every other time ATT is pulled low, and hence will function as intended. But we still need Q1 for that 60Hz input check, and so Jake devised this with a switch on the PCB that allows you to use either the Q1 or Q2 output, as appropriate for whatever game you're playing. And so that's how the flip-flop utilizes the ATT polling line to press buttons. Let's wrap up a couple last things on the full schematic before we finally get into the assembly. So we just talked about this switch, which changes between 30 and 60 Hz input checks. I had the button pins on the lower left in my simplified schematic, but on the real thing, they're over here on the upper right. In the current version of this mod, only cross and circle are included because again, this was designed with Final Fantasy VII speedrunning in mind. There's another switch here that's on the circuit board which allows switching between what button will have turbo applied. Of course, this could be extended to any button you want by connecting to the appropriate pins on the controller chip. 
These switches down here are the buttons for activating turbo. Switch 1 is a momentary on, meaning it's only activated while you're holding it down. When you release it, it turns off. Switch 2 is an on-off switch, and that means it latches and activates when you press it and stays that way until you press it a second time to deactivate it. These turbo buttons replace the analog sticks on the controller as to avoid cutting into the shell and adding new buttons. I'm going to pass it off to Jake for a minute to talk about one more piece of his schematic design before we finally get into the assembly. Take it away, Jake. All right, all right. Now, there is one more technical aspect of the ATT line. So I mentioned it goes low, the system reads the inputs, and then it goes high. And I acted as if it was all clean and pretty and everything's fine. However, oh, what is this? Do you see that annoying spike that happens afterward? That will actually sometimes trip the flip-flop as well. Well, it'll most of the time trip the flip-flop as well. And so I did need to implement a tiny bit more circuitry in order to get rid of that. So the ATT line, instead of just going straight to the flip-flop, it first goes through a resistor, and then the flip-flop is here, right? Here's the, here's the clock of the flip-flop. But then it also has a capacitor that goes to, how do you write ground this? The measurements of these two is such that the ATT line, instead of going down and going back up and then having that spike, it makes this part of it, look more like it kind of goes like and then and then it goes like and it gets rid of the spike the thing is that this still only has like once it crosses a certain threshold on the way up that's when it triggers the clock and so now it only does that one time per frame just like as it's supposed to rather than doing it twice per frame as this was causing it to do so that was just something i had to troubleshoot along the way and we've got it powered up and running uh, on a PlayStation right now. I'd like to take a uh, real-time readings from the oscilloscope here. If we take a look at that raw ATT line from the system like I was talking about, uh, here we can see it right there in real time. And we can see uh, that we can see that ugly downward spike I was talking about. So this, so this is what's coming in raw. But then once it gets through the resistor and on the other side of the capacitor to ground, we can see there it is nice and smooth on the other side of that. So there it is in real time. How about that? And that marks the end of our technical explanation. We tried our best to generalize and condense, but at the same time, that was the entire high-level breakdown of how this mod works. Maybe I should have warned y'all at the start that you were in for a 10-minute lecture. So, uh, yeah, anywho, it's time to move on to the assembly of the mod, and here we're gonna go a little more montage style so that we can get through it a little faster than we did the tech explanation. As you can see, we're running through all the components for the mod on screen now, and I'll put these in the video description as well with more detail on where you can get them. Jake is the one doing all of the assembly and soldering here, and when he's finished up, we'll cover a few last points and show this controller in action. So that's assembly complete. Now let's show this controller in action, and then we'll talk again with Jake on his final thoughts and what's in store for the future. All right, so here we go. You've made it. You're in game, Dr. Masho in hand, and we can see uh, right here just how useful it is um, and kind of the specific implementation here where it's very, very easy to stop and start the turbo. So again, kind of the whole thing is that I don't want to have a secondary turbo modifier button that you need to use to change the functionality of this circle button this one should just remain circle like normal all the time uh you know for your more precise button hits like that without having to uh flip the turbo 
on and off every time that you need to flip between doing that and just uh, passing some text boxes here. So here you see it. These text boxes are flying by. They couldn't be going any faster. Uh, and you have immediate access to, to start and stop at will. Oh, man. I, I, I never get tired of it. Never get tired of it. And then right here, boom, we can buffer our next movement. Go right back to the turbo. But then over here for the elevator, we need a more precise button hit. So for this one, we just, boom, hit the regular circle. And then here's the kicker. This is the best part. Is coming up here, we can buffer our movement into the next cutscene trigger. And starting now, there's like three minutes of cutscenes. So I can turn on this left one. And uh, with that one down, you can just set the controller down and allow this three or so minutes of cutscenes to just pass by right on its own here with that auto fire. And again, since these two switches are in parallel, that means that like once you're getting ready to end the cutscene, you don't even have to interrupt your turbo. You can start holding this one, disengage that one, and your turbo is uninterrupted, you know? And then same with when you start it. You can start with the right thumb, and then click this on, and then when you release that one, you just have, uh, you have your constant turbo. So, yeah, that's how that works. This controller, it's an awesome project. Thanks for getting me involved. Appreciate it, man. Oh, of course, thank you for showing it. So this controller is kind of perfect for what I use it for, right? But it isn't quite right for FF9 or maybe for your purposes. Of course, my least favorite thing about it is having to get rid of the analog sticks. I did that for like this very specific purpose of this controller. But if you want to keep the analog sticks, that's something that I want to work on in the future is instead having all of this turbo functionality be on a external board. This later one that I'm talking about is, it'll be the Masho EX, you know, because it's external. <laughs> Maybe just the Masho X, right? External. I like that, man. So I'm curious, how long did it take you to get this far? And when do you think the X will come out? Uh, so it took a long time to do this because when I started this project, I didn't know how to make a PCB. I didn't know how turbo worked on regular controllers. I didn't know what a flip flop was, you know? So like I had the idea to add turbo to a first party controller two or three years ago. I think like two years ago. Um, so this is about two years in the making. I think so. And it's, it's just been like, I had to learn one step at a time uh, how to do it. Oh, you asked when the, when the EX is coming out? Uh, I don't know. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>